So I'm just going to uh, use the book because that's so this chapter it was I think it's just a preview for like our trailers for chapter nine it's like so in chapter nine this is what we're going to do so in chapter nine this is what we're going to do I don't know if anybody ha had that experience reading oh, yeah. that yeah okay, she's so like just saying take 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 the uh the model as given and press on with it basically right Yes. So the three main things we discuss is we build from least squares to maximum likelihood to Bayesian inference. So as we are going on, we're, we're sort of proving that like maximum likelihood is just like least squares if it's in this particular format. And then um, Bayesian inference is maximum likelihood with a penalty and flat priors. So um, I guess this will be a refresher for most of you. But for me, the, the math side was like a bit, I, I went through it, but it was a bit confusing. Mm -hmm. But with, um, with least squares, the main idea is to minimize errors, right? So for the residuals, we're supposed to make sure that sum of squared residuals is very small. So this is all the math side that will be going on behind, let's say if you use LM, but he says he prefers GLM. So, Still here, he's, he's doing some math side and then matrix and vector computation. So I think I would take, um, if someone can, I don't know, this part, how do you want to do it? Do you want to go deep in? Then I would get maybe Ryan or Ron to explain some more for um, these parts or you want to take it as is. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, this is, by the way, this is a great chapter because, um, well, I mean, ultimately, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, wrong, but uh, least squares is just like one version of maximum likelihood, I guess. Is that right? Or, or something like that? So, yeah, maximum likelihood. I mean, least squares can be considered a maximum likelihood method with if the likelihood is a Gaussian, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. Like, um, but he says right here, yeah, that's what he's saying. Right here. I, I taught, um, you know, research methods to undergrads for 10 years. And yeah, of course, we don't teach them maximum likelihood, but we do teach them least squares because I think there's something kind of um, intuitive about it. You know, I mean, you, you calculate, the, you know, the residuals for each, you know, row and, you know, you kind of figure out a way to aggregate them in a way that, you know, gets you to some kind of minimized, um, you know um yeah i mean it makes sense like if you, if you, it's, it's it is intuitive because it's similar to like taking the mean right the mean is the value that if it has a that the standard deviation computed from that mean would be the smallest it could possibly be right yeah if you pick some other number would be bigger so it's a, it seems intuitive yeah it's a little bit like yeah like doing least squares is a little bit like getting you know the average this you know sort of discrepancy from right prediction Yes. So but the formula 8.2, for example, he doesn't expect you to just go oh, 8.1. Got it. 8.2 obviously follows from 8.1. No, I don't think you're supposed to be able to, to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that requires some linear algebra and, and to solve that. But yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, so just like the residual sum of squares is sort of like your overarching. Um, um, sort of, you know, way of looking at, you know, how well are you fitting this, this, this model, right? If it's that residual, the RSS is big, I mean, you're going to have issues or you should proceed, you know, carefully. Yes. And like in the beginning, he talks about like, we're doing it for like when one um, predictor, then if it's 
um, two predictors or two or more predictors, then how you calculate this um, sigma hat here is a bit mm -hmm. different. Yeah. So for most people, it's like all that's what is going on behind if you're using LM or GLM, mm -hmm. but it's, it's still cool to see, as we said, that um, least squares is just one version of maximum likelihood. Yeah. So, Can you go up, uh, scroll back up to the previous page? Um, yeah. Um, Yeah, the, the natural way to estimate would be to simply take the standard deviation of the residuals, but this would slightly underestimate because of overfitting as our, our base or set based on. Okay, yeah, I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. And you probably forgot because 99 times out of 100, well, I shouldn't say that, but often it doesn't matter because n is big enough where two is not important, but. Yeah, actually, that was, that was funny. Now that I think about it, I've read this like, like um, right away last week, and I, I haven't looked at it for like almost you know the week now. But yeah, this I, I don't that was a new that was a new thing for me. Like doing n minus two as a way of like um, uh, dealing with like underestimation. That was that was um, that was news to me. I mean, I've done n minus. I mean, we all do n minus one, you know, to do like you know estimated you know, population values, but I don't know. Yeah. So if you are using LM, can you specify N minus two or is like this is if you're calculating it by hand, probably? That's a good question. I, I don't think so. I mean, I don't know, Ron, what do you know about that? I would believe that LM would use that N minus two, but that is the correct estimator, the unbiased estimator. That's what you're supposed to use. So yeah. But I don't have R Studio open, so I can't ask. Hmm. I should open it up. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, though. I assume it does. So we probably have to look at the help package behind LM or to see. Yeah, I don't, that's a good question. I just don't. I don't know. Um, it doesn't. It's not really that important. I mean, but then actually, no. He does talk about how you can calculate some of squares directly. So if you scroll down. Yeah, I mean, so we can we can create a oh, function test to, do, it. to do this. Yeah, that's you know, that's pretty mm -hmm. cool. So we we yeah. But um, I think I'm sure one thing you um, stress in your research methods class was about only using like OLS if you have like. X and Y being normally distributed and yeah. then the errors being independent. Yes. Yeah, I mean, actually, well, I mean, actually what, what really needs to be um, normally distributed is, um, a lot, I think a lot of people, I don't know, Ron, do you, have you heard this? But like, you know, a lot of people always say it's not the variables themselves that needs to be normally distributed. It, it's the, do you know what it is, Ron? Well, it's the errors, certainly. Yeah. The errors, the residuals, yeah. right? Yeah, that, that's residuals, what ultimately yeah. needs to be. I mean, it's right here in the maximum likelihood calculation, right? It's saying that why that the predictions, the re response is normally distributed. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. With the with the mean that's linearly dependent, right? Yeah. But it will turn out that the coefficients are also normally distributed. I mean, the I'm sorry, the standard error in the in the coefficients is a normal distribution, the sample distribution of the coefficients. Is that the way you say? So, yeah. like, if you. <laughs> yeah. Because uh -oh. uh -oh. most of the time you do like a Q oh, yeah. on the errors or is working on. Sorry, you froze for a second. Him? Yeah, we oh, okay. froze yeah, for yeah. like a second though. Yeah. So most of the time we use a QQ plot to check. Mm -hmm. And does the QQ plot work on the errors or like for the real Y hat itself? Hmm. Um, I'm not sure what you're asking. Um, because it's like you use it to check if it's okay to use OLS. So oh, if the yeah. yeah, 
No, uh, yeah, you would definitely use Kiku plots as a great way. And I mean, um, yeah, I think also just a great thing to do would be like uh, to plot the residuals um, in a graph to, to kind of look at like what you're looking for is, uh, sometimes it's referred to like, Ron, maybe you've heard of this, but it's like a football shape kind of thing where like, you know, you have the, the residuals yeah. sort of just like are not directional, but they're just sort of, they, they kind of widen at the middle and then you know narrow at the the, range, at the ends of the ranges. By the way, this is a great chapter for you to do um, because, um, well, I mean, if you're doing that Bayesian class, I mean, this whole idea of doing maximum mm -hmm. that is, and the likelihood function is that's threaded through all of this. So, yes, yes, yeah, that's yeah, that this helped me in my. Uh, because we had the quiz on the other one. It was like, okay. <laughs> so I had yeah. read this chapter and it, it helped. So mm -hmm. then instead of using the optimizing function for least squared, now we're using likelihood functions. So which we are dealing with probabilities. And so we are using the PDF of the normal distribution. And we are trying to follow this equation here. So every y should be normally distributed for this a plus b x i, and then we should also have sigma here. So I guess did you want to see something, Ryan? No, no, no. That was, that was good. So I I've learned a lot about okay. So you have the posterior, which is like the likelihood times the prior over the marginal, marginal something, I forgot. <laughs> but um, here is raising likelihood. So do we still get posterior or is it really get posterior? If, like, this is a then great, great question for clarification because yes, you don't, right? The maximum likelihood is not really a Bayesian method. It's like a pre-Bayesian method. One, one just looks only at the likelihood and tries to maximize to find the optimal parameter that maximizes the likelihood, the a point estimate, right? And so you don't get a posture, you just get a point estimate, right? That's the first mm -hmm. thing that happens with the maximum likelihood. And mm -hmm. the second thing happens if there's no prior in this, so you don't really have a posterior anyway. You just, mm -hmm. what is the maximum likelihood? It's not a probability anymore. That P on the left is not really a probability, right? It is a probability of mm -hmm. Y. Right, but in Bayesian, mm -hmm. let me say it anyway. What that is, that's the probability of y given a, b, sigma, and the data. Right, so mm -hmm. that's what that that's the likelihood. Right, it is a probability. Right, but we don't care about the probability of y. So what you're saying, what's the most likely parameters that would give me this y? That's the maximum likelihood method. So the Bayesian method turns that around, and say no. What's the probability distribution of the a, b, sigma, x given the data that I got? So it turns that first that thing with that vertical bar to your left there. Right turns it around, but to do that, you need to introduce a prior, and then you actually get mm -hmm. no kidding posterior distributions. That's that's the cool thing about the Bayesian methods. So the likelihood is, the only thing I could say is it is sort of a posterior if you assumed a flat prior, because then you'd have the same answer. Mm -hmm. but. Right. Yeah, I do remember that from the Bayes, the flat prior idea from you know, doing sort of standard. So in some sense, yes. maximum likelihood is equivalent to a Bayesian with a flat prior, but it's actually a different way of thinking about it though too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we do talk about um, how we get the sigma in maximum likelihood here. And it says here, we don't do the one over N2 adjustment. You don't get it out of the maximum likelihood. It doesn't fall out. It does follow the Bayesian approach if you use proper priors and things, but yeah. Okay, so I guess, this this chapter is still trying to explain the idea of oh this what next section doing. I found so confusing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, because like if you're doing this, you're sort of trying to like is this an integration sort of trying to find because this is like a sum product of everything here. Uh, so it, this part is a bit confusing, but 
he says, okay, this is what likelihood looks like in visually. And then these are all different aspects of it, but it's, it's, it's still kind of not very clear. I remember these plots from when we did the other book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So does anybody have some explanation for this side or? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I didn't really like this whole section because he says, what does it say? It says, where do the standard errors come from? I'd love to know the answer to that question, but then he doesn't really address it. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. so, as far as I can the, standard errors, the standard errors are the difference between the data that you have and the estimated from the from the line, right? Mm -hmm. From the from the regression. So that's really the standard the standard errors, isn't it? Oh no, those mm -hmm. are the residuals. I don't know if that's he's they, talking well, about the standard error on the parameter estimates, right? So A, you know, we estimate A to be 46.2, B to be 3.1, but then there's an error on that, which he says that um, the data are consistent with A being roughly in the range of 46.2 plus or minus 1.6, just based on that, you know, and he, so he draws that likelihood plot saying, and that makes an ellipse in the, but he doesn't really say how he gets that ellipse or any of these other things, so I don't know. These kind okay. of plots, um, like the, the little plot on the lower right with all the many lines, that's actually a Bayesian plot. That he used to make that so mm -hmm. those are from draws from a bayesian posterior yeah i mean i know i know where the standard errors come from in the but he doesn't really explain that here very well yeah and he says that 50 draws from a bayesian posterior yeah. distribution yes yeah, so it's, so it's like mash things together here in a way that i didn't find very i don't know informative i don't that's just my opinion yeah, he's just like, just hurry up and come to Beijing in Ferris. <laughs> exactly. Maybe that's what it is. But I like that he's trying to connect the things you probably already know about to, you know, to the Bayesian method, but my uh, Bayesian inference method, because his approach seems to be that, hey, nothing wrong with the, the classical techniques, just I have to understand what they are, what they mean. And he prefers his Bayesian approach for these reasons, but, you know, he's not making a hard sell here. So he's trying to be show how all the things are connected, which I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yes. So he says in this little section, we're going to consider Bayesian as maximum penalized likelihood estimation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So where the prior is the penalty function. Okay. And just like what we do in Bayesian to get the posterior is like, is the prior and the likelihood that always would change the posterior a little bit, depending on what your prior is. If it's weakly informative, then it won't change it that much. It will depend on the likelihood. Or it's very informative, then there'll be lots of changes. So he talks here about that we're going to use medians and the median absolute deviations to where we are using Stan GLM. And he said he likes it because of how we can explain uncertainty and then how we can use the simulation like what we did in the um, posterior draws. Yeah. Okay. And like what you said, Ron, he talks about least squares being a point estimate and that's, we, we just don't want an estimate, we also want the uncertainty. So using uh, Bayesian, we are able to get these posterior simulations and help us understand, summarize the uncertainty using these uh, simulations. So for this part, because we did the other book, it wasn't too new to me, I, I, was, I was getting what was going on. Okay, uh, here, and, okay. And then with what we've been saying from the beginning, so least squares or maximum likelihood is just like having a uniform or flat prior, right? And, here he was talking about the influence of individual points in a fitted regression. 
So, like, and that's that side made me understand from like a least squares point of view that okay, least squares like you're trying to find a line that is in the middle, like every like residual is pulling it a little bit. So, um, I don't know if he went back to least squares when he was trying to explain Bayesian or I for this. Oh wait, I have gone back up, right? Probably. No, I am right on it. Yes. So he introduces Bayesian, but then he's he talks about um, Lee squares a little bit and how each point influences it. So does that happen also with a Bayesian? this sort of like the residuals pulling the line towards like a specific thing. Yeah, I mean, I think you're still, still yeah, you're still doing sort of the example level, like, you know, estimation of, you know, residuals and whatnot. For sure. Yeah, he isn't talking here about, I don't know if he talks about later. I mean, there's ways to avoid like outliers causing big poles and things like using a T distribution instead of a normal distribution, but what do they call that robust linear regression, I think. Right. Okay. But that's not, that's not unique to Bayesian. You can do that with maximum likelihood as well. Okay. So, and he's still, like, he's still trying to explain the difference between the three of them and then why each one works, the math behind the three of them. So I guess we go back to these squares and from like this picture, like it's like the weighted average of the slopes of different pairs. So as like what you said, like it's like you're finding these squares is like when you find a mean. So I understood that part um a little bit i just didn't know why he brought it like do you know why he brought it or it's just good background knowledge to know about these squares it's a good question i forget i remember reading this section and i'm going okay <laughs> i mean i think i he probably includes it because um it's you know like it's kind of cool. I don't know. The way most people know about, you know, regression is yeah. where, so it's sort of like, yeah. Like those who know least squares probably know a lot of our least squares with this. Yeah. Okay. So again, comparing LM and GLM and um, he talks about the idea of uh, being able to present uncertainty and then being able to obtain the standard errors. So like, that's what he was trying to do in the first place. So like, okay, use stand GLM because you can understand more about where the standard errors come from. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Yeah, and then he just talks about like, if it's a simple problem, and you're going to, it's probably the same because you just be using flat priors and for Bayesian. But it says when you have strong priors, then Bayesian inference does help to, because it's like the prior times the likelihood would change what the posterior looks like. So it says it helps you to put in that prior knowledge in when you have complex met um complex models yeah so lots of pr for vision here <laughs> and then he shows how to use stand glm to just do like a normal lm that will be using flat priors so making sure you use intercept null prior null and what is this AUX? Uh, good question. Auxiliary? 
Yeah, so the terminology of Stan is the, the auxiliary is the, uh, what do you call it, the, the sigma, right? The overall error, whatever, the, whatever distribution the residual should follow. That's the auxiliary distribution. Mm. The prior intercept is the prior intercept prior without anything is the slope, uh, the prior on the slope. Okay. And if you then have more slopes, there'll be more priors, yeah. <laughs> more priors, okay. And then you can even add to use the optimizing algorithm to make sure that it's directly instead of sampling. So tell it to use optimizing instead of sampling. Mm -hmm. I guess all this is quite, it's quite good to be able to, like if someone is using LM, how to make sure yours is also reproducible to his, so I like that. And now we're trying to understand how we would actually generate the uncertainty intervals with a Stan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're starting here. This this part was was, was quite interesting to me. I, I was <laughs> I just was doing a lot of this QT because I, I it took me a long time to actually understand how probability distributions do the random number generation, p norm, q norm. So like I I went to refresh all that for to use these ones. Okay, but, um, okay, this is when fitting models using stand GLM, you can get 68% or 95%. So this 68, 95, isn't it only for like normal distribution? But, but like- No, you can always, it, it comes from normal distribution, it comes from the one sigma, two sigma of normal distribution. But of course, you can ask for any distribution. What is the probability that this value is within 68% of the mean, right? Or of the mode even, or the median, I mean to say. So yeah, you can certainly ask these questions. Okay. So we use the 6895 just so that non bayesians are familiar with it. But you can ask what's the probability that is 60% or 70%. Or, or 50 or yeah. Okay. 99.99. There you are. Right. Okay, so we start out getting some fake data, which we fit using stand GLM. And then we get our intercept and then our X and then our mad SD. And then he's, I think he's showing us here how we would do the posterior draws, right? So is, is this what we're trying to do here? Yeah, posterior. exactly right. Okay, so fits was what we did here. And then it says when you, you get a matrix with simulations of the intercept of the coefficient of X and then, um, the standard deviation. So here, does this is it only the, the matrix that does that? Because it's like it's three columns, yes, but they'll just have one line each, right? Intercept has one line, X has one line, and then uh standard deviation has like one line. So how do you get the simulations? Well, no, it's, it's actually, uh, you know, I don't know how many rows by default, let's say it's like 10,000 rows of draws from those, the distribution of the intercept, the slope and the, and the auxiliary parameter, the sigma. So yeah, it's got a bunch of those. I mean, you should try it yourself, you'll see, it's going to have like, from the posterior distribution, it's going to have um, draws from the posterior distribution of those three, of the, of the, the joint probably joint posterior distribution of those three parameters, the intercept, the slope and the sigma. So it's going to have that all in fit. No, all in, uh, yeah. Would you, but fit is, a, is an object that's got all kinds of things. When you do it as matrix, it just pulls out the draws. There's other stuff in fit. Fit is a stand GLM object with all kinds of properties. Yeah. 
uh, the attributes is the right word, I think. <laughs> okay. So Fitz has these, these draws already inside of <laughs> these posterior distribution draws inside. And then when we are printing, we're just printing a little, just some of the attributes of fit. Yes, print is a method of the fit object that will give you that information right there. And it has, a, you can actually add um, options to that to suppress certain things that you want to, but yeah. Okay. There's a lot of documentation so, behind print uh, between Stan and GL. <laughs> a lot of options. Okay, so that I guess that was the the disconnect. I'm like, how do I get the many simulations? But it's already there in the many attributes of fit. So then you can use that to get the here we are using 0 0.025 and 0 0.975 quantiles. And then when we do that, we get between 2.6 and 7.5. And here is what we had first as our MADSD. And then it's not too far, like 5.1 times two times the MAD SD. It's, it's not too far from what we got here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so th thanks for the explanation. Th this, this part makes more sense now because I was like, there was a disconnect. And we have time for some exercises or questions or, mm -hmm. yeah. Can I tell you something? What I don't like about these books is that they stop exactly, I feel like, where they shouldn't because, so they give us all this code. I guess maybe the next chapter is gonna do that. But so yeah, they give us all see. this code about, um, okay, so this is your data, the fake data that you're going to be working with, and this is how you fit the, the linear regression, the simple linear regression, right? And then here's how you get your, um, your uh, what do you call this? Um, all your simulations, not, I don't like to call those simulations, but your 10,000 um, simulations, although I don't like to call that that, but anyway, and then the credible intervals and then that's it and then the most well not the most important but the part that will help you sort of understand it better for someone as visual as me is the graphs and then they mm. always stop before doing that and I feel like they shouldn't just a couple of more lines and then you would have had simple graphs and then all of this would have not made more sense but it would have been I don't know like yeah, they would just have given it a little tied extra, it right? together. Yeah. Yeah. But they always they always do that, I find that I find. But anyway, maybe they're more numeric people and I just I just like graphs, right? But anyway, I digress. If you want, I can share my screen yeah, and show you this I think, code. Yep. And then show us the graphs. Yes. Well, I didn't have the graphs, but I can show you the sims and you can see what it actually looks <laughs> we like. We want the graphs. <laughs> okay. No, no, it's fine. Uh, I can do them, but you know, let me just it would have been so nice to have them there. Okay, which one of these things is it though? Let's do this one, I guess. Yes. Yes. All right, you should see my R Studio now. Yeah. So I put I just copied in. Oops, hold on, this thing's gonna block. There we go. Just copied in the code that was in that part of the book, right? Mm -hmm. And here, by the way, is a little pointer. I think it's useful. And you're ever using Stan GLM, use this extra argument refresh equals zero, and it will suppress all the. Um, well, let me just show you what happens if you don't have it. You get this: <laughs> all the chains, all this information about the uh, about the what it, what it's doing behind the scenes during the Mark, Mark Carlo Markov chain. But you can suppress that with uh, it's a little known argument. It's not even the documentation. <laughs> but you only um, but this thing is only running one chain, right? Or it's four chains by default. By default, okay. runs four. Yeah, four chains. Ah, I see. I I don't have much experience using Stan. I use Jugs, so that's why I'm ah. always interested in asking these things. 
So uh -huh. this is basically what he showed all there's a little bit more information when you print it with just the default arguments it actually tells you about the formula to use and um, the, the family, you know, that's the error function. And here's the intercept, just like you were saying. And then instead of doing it as a matrix, we can do it as a data frame or a table. I didn't load the tidyverse yeah, to get the samples out. And then you can just see uh, what they look like, right? So mm -hmm. it's one draw, it's, it's how many is it? I don't even know how long it is. 4,000, it turns out as default. 4,000 draws from the po joint posterior of intercept, uh, the slope and the error. And that's what he's using to calculate quantiles and th stuff for these. And you can calculate, mm -hmm. you know, maybe there's, you can actually plot X and the intercept and X and make sure they're, you know, how independent they are and whatnot. I shouldn't try to code in pro public though. How do you do without using GG? <laughs> I guess it's plot, plot right? Yeah. <laughs> This is an example of the correlation between these two. That's kind of that. That's kind of like that likelihood plot he was showing before, right? But now it's a scatter plot of the actual draws. Mm -hmm. So you can see there is a high correlation, some correlation between. It makes sense. That's what he said, right? So when the intercept is um, higher, the slope has to be uh, intercept is lower. The slope has to be higher in order to compensate for that, right? Mm -hmm. it was in, that was actually in the, that chapter he mentioned that that there's a correlation. But here you can see it in the in the posterior draws of the joint distribution. Anyway, I just wanted to, I thought that'd be useful to see since you can actually see that. Oh, I see. Now I see what he's taking quantiles of. These are all these samples from the distribution. Yeah. I don't know if that was actually as helpful as I was hoping. But. And if you do, <laughs> could you do like a, I don't know if a histogram, like a density plot of just X and just yeah, the intercept? Yeah, that, I feel like that's what they should have included here, but. I don't know if density is instead of plot. I don't know, or if, because if not, it, uh, histogram or whatever. Well, let's see what that does. I never, I'm not yeah. very good at base R. No, that's not what I want. How do you, what, how do you make a density plot in base R? Yeah, that's what I don't oh, remember. Uh, I am ggplot. You, you want to do, um... There's actually a lot of information where the density function is. So what is that function? <laughs> and a nice function. Oh, you have to do first, I think, density to fit the kernel. Oh, uh, yeah. And you then want... you plot that. So you name an object here it's and the use the density function, I think. If that. not a histogram, maybe. I just put something in the, in the chat for you, Ron. Oh, awesome. How do I end up volunteering to code in public? <laughs> <laughs> I have to find the chat window. Oh, just plot. Just like I was doing that, I guess that would work, huh? There we go. There you go. Exactly. Yeah, so, so then you can, can see. That's yeah. That's a marginal distribution too, right? So it's going to be fatter. Yeah. Remember that, that, see, look, it's actually distribution along this margin, but I guess it doesn't what do you, matter. which one do you have there? Uh, X. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that's, that's great. That's, that's the kind of thing you can do with all these, with all these uh, draws. You can show the actual distribution of the, of your estimated, uh, not belief in what the parameter is. Right. And then the credible intervals would be like a little like the center and then a little portion of that, right? So, yeah, um, I mean, we could plot those, but yeah, um, let's say I'm just gonna make something up. So that would be between two and eight, right? Your 95% yeah. credible interval would say, would say that the mean X is between those values. Right. And we could just use quantile to ask that though. Yeah, and then, Or what I want density. So does it probably go first or second? I'm assuming. But is it density or? It's not density. I don't know where I got that from. Let's Maybe see. you can do it uh, straight from the Sims, right? Like the book says. That's yeah. what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The book open. Nine seven five. Is that the right way to do it? Yeah. 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 What yeah. do I have the arguments backwards? I know. So there you go. Yeah. So two yeah, point seven. Two point six and seven. Okay. Well, pretty, yeah. pretty close what you said, two and eight, not too far off. 
but that's the right way of interpreting it, right? Yes. Like, so yeah. the X would be between these two values. I mean, 95% yeah. probability. Yeah, exactly right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Because I always have a, I always have a hard time stating the difference between the confidence interval in a frequentist um, framework versus the credible intervals in a Bayesian framework. I know they're not the same thing, but my brain confuses them or mixes them or something. Everybody's brain confuses them, mixes them up. <laughs> Usually the, the right? mix up happens that people interpret confidence intervals as if they were credible intervals. <laughs> That's the usual mix up. Because uh... what, what confidence intervals really mean is it requires you to think of everything backwards, you know? <laughs> it's like if I repeat the same experiment over and over again, you know, the mean, the yeah. value I found would be within this interval. 95% of the time. Yeah, you have to like twist yeah. your brain around. <laughs> yeah. 95 of the, yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah, exactly. I always, I always confuse them. It's, I don't know, horrendous for my brain that my brain, after reading it so many times, it just, I cannot really <laughs> grasp that concept. It's so That's frustrating like to the, me. Well, the Bayesian, because kind of the, the naive way of interpreting the credible interval is actually the right interpretation in some ways in some sense oh, yeah now i have another question if it's okay or, or are we done or no, someone got, wants I'm... to do something else okay so then so this is just so those graphs right and the code that you had i can i should actually put my camera so that you can see my face and not asking into the void um okay so that is just showing me an estimate of not not Mm, yeah, like an estimate of those coefficients, right, that are in my um, in my model, which would be the intercept and the x in this case and the sigma, the error associated with that. But if I want to make a plot where I predict the linear, like um, like that linear regression, right, where I predict how x is going to how y is going to vary according to this x that I'm using. And I want to see exactly that relationship, not just the coefficients. Then what I do is I have to draw simulations from all of this coefficients that I just estimated. And then I can do that plot, correct? Because that is just, like that x is just 5.1, the intercept is minus 13.8. So that's just like a like a like a value that I can use, or those are values that I can use, I suppose, to, uh, to run 10,000 simulations, 100,000 simulations, however many you want, so that I can have now like sort of the, the line, that line that explains the association between x and y. Well, let me just say this. Um, yes, you're basically right, but there's some details, and that is exactly the topic of chapter nine, the next chapter. So prediction. Oh. Behavior. In fact, I just looked Stay at the tuned. next page, and I see those histograms you were talking about. They're right there, the first or the uh, second page of that chapter. So we're a little ahead already on that. I'm but, so uh, sorry. I will then no, it's save good. my it's questions actually good that you're for later. Where we're going. So you're actually right. I, that is pretty much what you have to do to make your predictions to incorporate. The thing is, you're making a prediction. It should incorporate not only the uncertainty in the uh, and certainly due to the uh, residual, you know, you know, there's some uncertainty to that, but also due to the uncertainty in the coefficients, that should be included as well. And that's one thing that Bayesian kind of gives you for free by taking these draws and then making making many, many predictions that way. Oh, yeah, take it. But you, okay. You can also plot lines, the single lines that you want to, like the median slope and intercept. You know, you can certainly do that as well. To have a traditional line, but it depends what you're trying okay. to do. You know what I guess. But, Thank you. Yeah, no, that's um okay, perfect. Sometimes it's like your brain understands it and then it truly, truly understands it only after you have spoken it or you have verbalized it, I suppose. So thank you. You're actually, yeah, that's funny. I find that happens a lot. There's some book I read by mm -hmm. I think it was Steven Pinker, the language instinct. He talks about this, and like that's one of the reasons I think language developed because not for talking to other people as much as talking to yourself because it connects parts of your brain that aren't normally connected directly, like from your mouth to your right. ear. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at least for me, it works. I don't know if it yeah. works for others, but I, I need to do that. 
<laughs> yeah, me. It does work for me. Right. And and get the verbal confirmation from someone else that yes, you're yeah. correct. Two plus two yeah. is four. Move on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your your question has really helped to make this chapter like visual and make it stick. Yeah. Hey guys, I, I have a meeting this week at the four, so I need to leave a few minutes early to prep. But um, I will be doing uh, unless you want to. If uh, uh, it, Gabby, if you're interested in doing chapter nine, I, you can do that. Otherwise, I'll do it in uh, two weeks. No, you're fine. Yeah. So uh, I will uh, see you all um, in uh, two weeks on chapter nine. Yeah, and if you, anybody has any, you know, wants to do some exercises and discuss them on the Slack. Okay. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, anyway, that'd be fun. All right. All right. See y'all. See you in two weeks. Bye.